Hello, my name is Jason Kendall, and welcome to yet another one of my introductory astronomy lectures. Last time we discussed something very interesting, which was called the Michelson-Morley experiment. And the Michelson-Morley experiment attempted to find the uh, medium in which light traveled. So let's see really why that had to exist and why the results of the Michelson-Morley experiment gave rise to this thing that we call special relativity and general relativity. So let's take a couple steps back and review exactly where the paradox came from and the dilemma that's forcing the existence of relativity. All right, so first, let's go back and look at Sir Isaac Newton's mechanics. So uh, Isaac Newton supposes throughout his entire idea of how the, the world works, the Newtonian mechanics assumes an absolute space and an absolute time. Meaning, if you look at any one of the equations, there's no time for you, time for me, this is the time. No, he just says the time. And the time means there is a purportedly some clock in the universe that is permeates the entire universe through which time progresses uh, step by step, second by second, hour by hour. So what then is time? It is this marching progression of clocks that are the same everywhere in the entire universe. Likewise, uh, Newton uh, postulated the existence of an absolute space. An absolute space means that it's just kind of our way of thinking about space is that it's a very, very simple thing to think that space just is and there's an absolute reference frame for space, meaning that you go left, right, backwards, forwards, up and down and however you wish to move in space. So. According to Newton's ideas, space, uh, you, you are inexorably dragged forward in space, but you can move around however you like, uh, dragged forward in time in one direction, but you can, you're free to move backwards left and right, which is kind of like forwards and back in space. Um, the equivalent way of thinking about it is we can't go backwards in time. In the same way, uh, just imagine that we said the following thing. It's kind of a cute uh, linguistic trick. But imagine that we had the same limits to one of our spatial dimensions that we apparently do with one of our time dimensions. Okay, so imagine that we could only go right, that there is no left in this. So we can go forward and back in time, pretend that, that'd be kind of weird. But then as a cost for that, imagine we could only go up or down, forwards and backwards, and right. Imagine that the concept of leftedness, going left, that you couldn't do it. And people would say, oh my goodness, I want to go left in space. Well, you can never go left in space, that's the thing. Uh, because you can't go left in space. It's a fundamental physical law. But you can go forwards and back in time, but you can't go left in space. That's kind of what we're talking about. It's kind of this very strange absurdity. So, but let's see what we really mean, but let's see some other implications of this. Um, when Newtonian mechanics lives, then you can have simultaneous events. Simultaneous events means two things happening separated in space that happen at the same time. That's simultaneity. And so we can think of two heartbeats separated by a few miles. It's a very romantic notion. Uh, we can think of two people seeing the moon in the sky at the same time. We can think of, of two, car, uh, two cars um, driving down two different highways and passing, uh, a, a, uh, we can say they turn on the radios at the same time. So there's lots of ways of things you can think about being simultaneous, meaning things that happen is separated by either small distances or very large distances that apparently happen at the same time. All right, so another way we can then think about the nature of absolute space and time is how Newton thought about it. Newton said that feeling of acceleration, that inertia, the concept of inertia is, a, is, is when you are accelerating with respect to absolute space. So as you accelerate with respect to absolute space, you experience this thing called inertia because it's a resistance to acceleration. All right, another way of looking at it is if you, and Newton actually did this himself, he called it the rotation of a water in a bucket. So if you rotate, take a, uh, take a bucket of water and rotate it, the water knows to go to the edge of the bucket. Why? Because it's moving with respect to absolute space. Or at least that's how Newton thought about it, is that it was a rotating frame. And so since it's rotating with respect to the entire universe, 
Therefore, with respect to all of absolute space and time, and those philosophers out there know this is an interesting and very thorny thing to talk about, but then the rotation of the bucket with the water in it as it goes out to the side, he said, ah, so therefore, this is a rotation with respect to the known universe, and so it knows that. And so that's rotation. Um, finally, uniform motion then is therefore indiscernible inside of absolute space and time. What does that mean? Well, this goes back to Galileo's idea, and Galileo's idea of having the little per the people inside the ship. Well, we'll get to that in a second. But uniform motion in space and time, we've already known is indiscernible. So if you are inside a car driving down a straight highway at 80 miles an hour, you know, Highway 80 in New Jersey, just so the state troopers don't get you, but in any event, um, you're driving down a straight highway, you're going fast, and you throw a ball up and down like a juggler would. The ball goes up, goes straight up, and falls straight down. Now, you can't tell that you're moving fat 80 miles an hour straight forward until you look outside the car window. But even then, you don't know, unless, well, you know because, you know, it's experience, but it could be that the entire universe is rushing past you at 80 miles an hour and you are standing still. You can't tell the difference between the two. Now, from the outside, looking into the car, as you throw the ball up and juggle, the, the juggling ball apparently goes up and down forward. It stays inside the car, so tracking its plot by looking at how it moves from outside, it makes an arc. It goes up and comes down. So a very simple idea is it kind of goes up like that and down like that, but we know there's a parabolic arc because it's a throw and there's gravity, etc., etc., but let's ignore that for just a second. So. The ball does not do a straight up and down move if you watch it from the side as it goes by. Because if the ball had moved straight up and down as you threw it, then it would be behind the car. It's not. So the, add, the, velocity, the speeds with which things move add. So in, we, this all comes back to this concept of what we will call an inertial frame of reference. An inertial frame of, re inertial frame of reference, dun 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 dun. Uh, it is a, a frame of reference that where you lay down a whole bunch of sticks and clocks inside a room such as this one and you put meter sticks everywhere and nobody can quite move because everything's lined with meter sticks and twigs and branches and stuff. But the, on the intersection of every little twig and branch, there's a little clock and all the clocks inside this frame are all set to be the same. And so a, a, room, a small room is actually a good way of thinking about it. So a laboratory in which you may do experiments. You can put clocks all throughout the room and synchronize those clocks inside that room. You can also lay down measuring sticks inside that room. And that will give you measurements of distance and measurements of time all throughout that room. And no matter how that room moves, those clocks and those sticks will stay the same. That's what we mean by an inertial frame of reference. Now, you don't feel any push to the side or pull to the side. That would be a non-inertial frame. Say somebody puts that room like in a merry-go-round. It swings around and around and around. Then it's no longer inertial because you feel a push towards the side of the wall. Now, we're strictly speaking not an inertial frame because we're in a gravitational field, so you have a preferred reference, which is down. So. Let's take this inertial frame and set it way out in space so everything inside that room is floating. So you got a whole bunch of floating critters and nobody's bolted down and the sticks are all the same, the, the room is small and the clocks are everywhere all the same and so all those synced up. That's what we mean by an inertial frame. And so if you then move that inertial frame fast in one direction and it's all inside one speed, everything's moving left say, because we like the word left, we eliminated it from space and time, but now we're adding it back. So it's moving to the left with respect to some observer. And then people do experiments inside the room. What do you see inside the room? You see all the normal laws of physics, all of them. And if you choose to be outside and look at them, you see most of the normal laws, but all the speeds are added together. That's the nature of an inertial frame of reference. All right. Well, of course, we talked about that a long time ago. With Ga in a previous lecture with Galileo. Because Galileo came up with this concept of relativity as well, and he's, he, uh, he, he po posited the idea that all inertial frames are the same. They're all equal. And how did that, what does that mean? Every single inertial frame in the universe 
is the same. That's an interesting statement. So if you have an inertial frame and it's moving, the laws of physics you measure inside that inertial frame are the same as if you were in any other inertial frame doing any other kind of uniform motion, non-accelerating, non-rotating motion. So you can't tell the difference between one inertial frame and the other. You, let's say you have two, two of these rooms and they're approaching each other really fast. They're going to miss, but they're going to miss. They're going to go by each other. Each of them, there's a relative speed. Maybe they're going really fast, like, like 1,000 miles an hour or something, and they're going by each other. Inside the one that's going to the left, they'll see all the rules and laws of physics and everything like that will be the same here. And then the one going to the right would also see the same laws of physics as it goes to the, its direction. So all laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. Okay, we're almost there. So now, Maxwell's equations come along. And when Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism are assembled, he, they don't fit with those other two ideas. They don't fit with the inertial frames idea. And they don't fit with the absolute time and space idea. It doesn't fit. And why? Because all speeds are relative, according to Newton and Galileo. All of them. All speeds are relative. OK, cars going by, people in ships going smooth on oceans, all of them. And in Newtonian mechanics, a speeds just add. So when the inertial frame is going by at 1,000 miles an hour, and let's say you choose to throw a ball inside the inertial frame forward at 10 miles an hour, the speed with which the ball is going to an outside observer is 1,000 miles an hour plus 10, which is 1,010 miles an hour. That's if the inertial frame is going by you at 1,000 miles an hour. So in Newtonian mechanics, all speeds add. And also, all speeds are relative inside Newtonian mechanics and Galilean relativity. Well, here's the problem. Maxwell found in his equations of electromagnetism, which were determined experimentally, experimentally determined things in postulated um, uh, in inertial reference frames. Well, inertial is best you can get inside of the Earth's gravitational field, but we'll ignore the Earth's gravitational field for now and call a reference frame on the ground inertial-ish, okay? He found that if you solve the equations and determine a speed, uh, that there's, that a wave equation can fall out of the, of the four equations for Maxwell's, rel Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism, that a wave equation can fall out, and the speed of that wave equation depends on two experimentally verified constants. One is the permittivity of the vacuum or free space, and the other is the permissivity of, of the vacuum or free space. So the permittivity is for the electric field, and the per permittivity is for the magnetic field. And these things, these two constants, were related to the amount of charge or current and the force that was then pushed against things. So they were measurables. So he said, how much charge do we have? Uh, what's the force that we feel on a test charge? OK, fine. There's a conversion factor, and that conversion factor is the epsilon, which is, which is the permittivity of free space. And let's say you have a magnetic field, and that, is the, uh, that goes with the Lorentz force. And the Lorentz force shows that if you move, a, uh, move charges through a magnetic field, you get a force. So now, that per those two constants combined together uh, are there, if you multiply those two constants and take their square root and the reciprocal, you get the speed of light identically, identically. So inside of the wave equation, the solution for Maxwell's laws in a wave equation gives the speed of light, not relative to anything else, just a speed. So wait a second, now we got a problem. And what's the problem? The problem is Maxwell's equations say that there is a speed, and that speed is the speed of light. OK, but Newtonian mechanics says that speeds add. And Galilean relativity says all inertial frames are the same. So now we are at the crux of a problem. And the problem is Newtonian mechanics, uh, which says that there's an absolute space and an absolute time. And Galilean relativity, which says that all inertial reference frames are equal, and Maxwell's laws, which 
state that with after you go through them all say that there's an absolute speed and a, an absolute speed called the speed of light that's derived from experimentally derived values so you've got three things and you can only have two of them that's the problem they're in conflict because the speed of light don't add but that's what Maxwell suggested to Michelson and Morley in our lecture from last time. That's what Maxwell said, hey guys, why don't you go, it's kind of a loose suggestion, but the idea is that the community, the scientific community said this whole thing, and Maxwell, I believe, even stated as such to them. It's like, this, this speed needs to be known. And if the speed of light is what it is, then the speeds must add if we're moving through a medium. Okay, now last time we learned that the Michelson-Morley experiment did not find any change in the speed of light with respect to any movement of the Earth around the Sun, how it moved, what time of year, when they did the experiment, how the orientation of the experiment, they could find no change at all. So therefore, the speed of light did, so because, well, it's like, because what was the ether? The ether that they, Michelson and Morley were trying to dis, were trying to measure, would have been that ultimate reference frame that Newton demanded. Newton said there's an absolute time and an absolute space, and the ether would have represented that because of the speed of light being constant inside of the inside of Maxwell's equations. So, the discovery that the speed of light is a constant no matter how you move violates either the, uh, the inertial reference frame meaning you got to get rid of you got to play with Newton's laws or you got to play with you got to play with Maxwell's laws and say only if you're moving in a particular particular way do they work or you keep Maxwell's laws and you do something else and we'll see what that something else is next time see you soon